Hello everyone and welcome to our July General Club. Uh, in this webinar we'll be hearing from two fantastic presentations on the topic of survival analysis. Uh, both presenters will be sharing work using a Bayesian framework. Our first speaker is Peter Thau, a professor in the Department of Biostatistics at MD Anderson Cancer Centre. Our second speaker is Dr. Kayu Hali, um, assistant professor at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Our discussants today are Axel Gandhi, uh, a chair in statistics in the Department of Mathematics at Imperial College London, and Nebi Bekeli, uh, who is vice president for the biostatistics and, and statistical programming at Gilead Science. So with that, I'm gonna hand over now to Peter for our first presentation. Thank you, and I appreciate your inviting me. So let's see, I'm, I've clicked show my screen. Can you, can you see it okay? Yep. Can you see my screen? That looks good. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. So I, I've, I um, have listed my collaborators in the bottom of the title slide. Uh, Peter Mueller is sort of the, the godfather of uh, uh, applied Bayesian nonparametric models. And then people who do the heavy lifting, Yan Shen Chu in particular, and uh, Riza Mehran and Boy Anderson are, are medical. Uh, 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 people, ph physicians with whom I've collaborated that generated some problems. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll spend three slides on, it's a, it's a bit theoretical, but I think we need to have a, a, a mathematical basis for what these models are. And I, I'm not going to torture you too much. And then I'm just going to go through three examples. So it was kind of hard picking them, but uh, uh, they're all Bayesian non-parametric model based. And uh, well, very different sorts of applications, and so I'll describe them when I get to them. So this, this may look a bit mathematical for those of you who haven't seen it, but the ideas are actually quite primitive. So I think everybody knows that what Bayesians do is consider parameters to be random and endow them with prior probability distributions. So Thomas Ferguson had the idea in 1973 to put a probability distribution on the entire probability distribution, which I've denoted by F. So F is just any probability distribution. And rather than make, assume that it's a parametric model, you just give it a probability distribution. And that distribution is, is called the Dirichlet process, denoted by DP. And it's got, it has two hyperparameters. Alpha naught is a positive real number. It's a scaling parameter. And G naught is the probability measure the, or the base measure. And then you can represent this Dirichlet process, uh, which is G as an infinite uh, uh, weighted average of a bunch of point masses. And so Delta theta H puts a, a point mass of one at the value theta H. <clears throat> and so the, the theta H's are IID according to the base probability measure. And, and so the delta of theta h is just a direct delta function. And, and so uh, Seth Raman had the idea of representing the weights using this beta distribution. So if you write down a beta distribution with parameters one and alpha, then the eighth weight, weight has got this, this particular representation. And it's convenient because it facilitates computing. Um, and so one of the ways to understand the Dirichlet process prior on a distribution f is that if you partition uh, the, the outcome space, say into A1 through AR, you can think of this as, as intervals that, that if the outcome space is the reals that partition it, then the distribution of the probability of A1 through the probability of AR itself is Dirichlet. And the parameters are, are the base, the, the scaling parameter alpha naught times G naught of A1 and so on. Um, now, if you observe data, say y1 through yn that are distributed according to f, then the posterior of f is again a Dirichlet process and you update the parameters by adding the sample size to the scaling parameter and then taking a weighted average of g naught in these point masses. And, and so it's, it's very easy to compute a posterior. And then um, the, the, the Dirichlet process has this property that it puts all of its probability mass on discrete distributions. And so if you want continuous distributions, you say, well, let's replace this, this uh, direct delta function with a normal distribution. So you say, well, I want a normal distribution that's got its mean at some value theta h and we'll give them all the same variance. 
And so this is the key idea here is that a Dirichlet process really is a mixture of normals. And it turns out you can approximate almost anything to any degree that you like with a mixture of normals. In practice, there aren't infinitely many terms. This sum ends at five or six or something like that. But here's the neat thing about it, or a neat thing, is that these thetas uh, uh, here don't have to be real numbers. They can be any random objects. They can be matrices, images, graphs, dogs, cats, anything you like. And so all of this structure can be used to put very flexible probability distributions on any kinds of objects. And people have started to do that, and the, the results in terms of applications are astonishing. So Steve McAkern, uh, 20 years ago, had this idea, well, how do you extend this to do regression? And all he did was say, well, I want the, the mean of the, say if F is the, the CDF of, of the distribution, given some covariate vector Z, it replaced the theta H with a, a, a combination. If you see down here, it's just the usual thing you see in regression. And so if, you know, instead of the direct delta function, you have a normal, and then you say the mean of the normal is a function of the covariates. Now you have a mixture of normals that themselves are regression functions. Um, so the last idea is that um, you say, well, I want to uh, model this mean function for the normals. And uh, we do that using a, something called a Gaussian process prior. And so what is that? Well, if you take any Z, say Z1 through Zn, so N vectors of covariates, the, the, the Gaussian process theta of Z1 through theta Zn has some, got some mean vector uh, and some variance covariance matrix. And that's it. And so if we assume that each the theta H's are, are distributed according to a Gaussian process prior, with a mean being a rather simple thing, and then some variance covariance structure um, where the, the betas are multivariate normal, we have what's called a dependent Dirichlet process. So this is the sort of thing that you would take several days to absorb with all the details, but I thought it would be good to walk you through it because I'm going to be applying this in, in the applications. Here's the first one. So I'm jumping from a bunch of uh, uh, mathematical symbols to just application. So Riza Mehran, a surgeon at MD Anderson, came to me with a problem that he wanted to design a randomized trial to compare a gel sealant called ProGel to standard of care for controlling intraoperative air leaks after lung resections. And the standard of care is they use sutures and staples. And so having leaky lungs after you've had a resection is a pretty severe problem. It doesn't kill the patient, but it causes them to stay in the hospital and suffer quite a bit. So the outcome is simply the number of days to resolve the intraoperative air leak. And if we allow the possibility that T could be zero if the patient never develops an air leak. So the background is the mean time to, dissolve, to resolve an intraoperative air leak is about eight days. So the patient is suffering for a little over a week. And if you say, well, let's just do a t-test. So if you do a one-sided two-sample 0.05 level t-test, sort of you know simple elementary statistics, you say, I want the mean to drop 25% from eight to six days. I have a power of 80. If you just turn the crank, you say, it turns out you need 476 patients. That's a lot, especially at a place like MD Anderson. If you say, well, let's use the log of t plus one and then repeat the computation, the sample size is 280, the trial's not feasible, so you can't do it. Um, a multi-institution trial, may, may, yes, but not at one institution. So I, I then had my stat analyst draw a histogram of the data from people that had gone through thoracotomies to see how long it actually took <clears throat> to resolve the air leaks. And you see the distribution is anything but normal. It's multimodal, it's asymmetric, and so obviously, since the T distribution requires a normality assumption, that's wrong. So you, you can't do that. And so I decided to talk to my, my colleagues and cook up a Bayesian nonparametric model based design. So the a Bayesian nonparametric model for T that, that, that we cooked up, it accounts for the skew sca, uh, shape of the distribution. It accounts for multimodality. Remember, it's a mixture of normals and allows a point mass at zero. So here's what the distribution looks like. I'm going to index the, out, the treatments in this randomized trial, zero for control, one for progel. We're going to randomize patients. And the, 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 for treatment G, 
it's a mixture of a point mass at zero and then this this distribution mixture of normals uh, um, for the you know the rest of the distribution the people that don't have no no air leak at all it takes some time to resolve it and we impose the constraint that things can only get better with progel because actually it's inert it doesn't react with the cells so it can't harm you um, and so we assume the two thetas the, for the, the each of the sumans here for the normal means are iid with a multivariate normal truncated base measure it's got to be truncated because you can't have negative values and we allow ties um, since we we record time up to 20 days so here's the histogram drawn again and then here are uh, 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 smooth distributions hypothesized red is for progel uh, and you see there's a point mass at zero where there's the hypothesized uh, no intraoperative air leak at all. And then the black is the, the smooth version of the thing on the left. And so we're going to test the hypothesis of is it the red thing or is it the, the, the black thing? Um, we're comparing distributions. So here are elicited utilities. And I do this a lot. So I sat down with Risa Mehron and I said, look, if the utility for no operative no air leak is 100, then he said, well, if it takes 40 days or longer, you get a zero. And these other numerical values are the goodness or utility of resolving an air leak in five or 10 or 15 days and so on. And you see, if it takes five days, the utility drops by half. And if it takes 10 days, it drops from 50 to 10 and then trickles to very tiny values thereafter. And, and so the technique here is instead of using T, we're going to use U of T to make decisions. And the, the decision-making scheme, I've drawn the pictures of the null and alternative distributions again. Here are the elicited utilities that they induce. And here are the mean utilities under the two hypotheses. That is, the, the alternative says the progel's got a higher mean utility. So all of this distribution is mapped into mean utilities. That's the idea. It's, it's pretty primitive, but it's actually quite practical. It's a, it's a dimension reduction problem. And so the mean utility, I'm going to write U bar sub J to be the, the mean utility under the Jth distribution, and J is zero or one in this kind of comma, uh, given the data. And the decision criterion is this eta function. It says, well, what is the probability the mean utility with progel exceeds the mean utility with standard of care by some epsilon given the data? And the decision rules are if this, this posterior criterion is bigger than some other upper cutoff, you stop and say, wow, progel is, is superior. And if it's below some lower cut, cut off, you stop for futility and you say, no, let's not bother going on. So to get a feasible design, we talked about it quite a bit. And the epsilon is 18 utility points. And there's a whole discussion in the background that whereby we came to that. But the sample size is 48 patients. That may seem tiny, but this structure actually is rather information rich. And it allows you to get a lot out of 48 patients who make decisions at 16, 32, and 48, imposing exact balance with the randomization. And so here are the operating characteristics of the design. So MSS is mean sample size. TIE is type 1 error. And, and you see, we've gotten tons of scenarios. The type 1 error is tiny, it's very well controlled. And PCD is the probability of a correct decision. And you see, under the various scenarios, you see four is a hard scenario. I haven't gone into details of what the distributions look like, but the design actually has got extremely good properties. So the probability of a correct decision, which is that you want to accept the null in these four scenarios and reject it in these, these others, is, is actually quite high. So you, we're getting a lot of mileage out of 48 patients. I'm going to jump immediately to personalized PK-guided dosing in allogeneic stem cell transplantation. So intravenous busulfan is a key component of the preparative regimen for allogeneic stem cell transplantation. <clears throat> what they do is uh, characterize systemic busulfan exposure using pharmacokinetics by the AUC, the area under the plasma concentration curve. And if the AUC is too high, you get severe life-threatening toxicities. But if it's too low, you have high risks of disease recurrence, graft failure, and death. And so what you do is determine each patient's optimal AUC interval for therapeutic dose by first administering a preclinical dose to figure out their pharmacokinetics. Here's a graph I drew. It's a smooth martingale residual plot many years ago, back in 2002. And when I showed this to Bory Anderson in my office, he literally began jumping up and down. 
because what this shows is the risk of death is lowest in some sweet spots, some mid-range, and it's higher if the AUC is too low or too high. And this triggered lots and lots of activity to find the sweet spot. And so the latest question, which came up a couple of years ago, is, well, can we personalize this? Can we use age and complete remission status, either you're in complete remission or you have active disease? Um, can we use those, since they're strongly predictive of survival, do they interact with AUC? <clears throat> and so what we did is we took an historical data set of 151 patients who had gotten uh, uh, allogeneic transplants with IV busulfan combined with this other stuff. But uh, we can't extend this data set because it's no longer ethical to do this. That is, we, they, they, they didn't find the optimal interval. And so we fit this dependent Dirichlet process with a Gaussian process prior, and here were the covariates. And it was the, a, PK, the, the patients AUC, their age, and whether or not they were in remission. And you see the, the plot of overall survival. It's, it's anything but a nice you know, unimodal distribution, whether it's on the raw scale or the, the log scale. So a, a, a Bayesian non-parametric model is great. I'm not going to go through all of this. This is uh, an update of the DDP, the, the Gaussian process prior that Yang Shen Chu figured out recently, which improves it nicely. And we don't have time for it, but it's a nicer version of it. So here's the output. Here's the payoff. So once you fit this, this updated version of the DDPGP to this data set of 151 patients, you see that the AUC in each plot is along the horizontal. The, the mean survival time on the log scales on the vertical. And what we've got is the, the uh, 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 I'm varying CR from no in the first row to yes in the second row. And then age goes from 30 to 40, 50, and 60. And you see that the interval is plus or minus 10% of the max, and it moves down. That is, as the patient gets older, the optimal interval goes down. And also, as you go from having no active disease to having, uh, having uh, 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 active disease to no active disease, the interval also changes. So the, the bottom line on this picture is that it is, it, it's a graphic that will certainly change therapeutic practice, because depending on the patient's age and, and whether or not they have active disease, the targeted interval for IV busulfan will differ. So this is a perfect example of personalized medicine uh, implemented using a Bayesian non-parametric model. And discovering these interactions is something that uh, you would be very hard pressed to do with a conventional model. Remember, the, the, the model is basically an infinite mixture of normals. So um, uh, this is the details of how we did it, and I'm not going to bother with, with why we use the, 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 the optimal AUC is just the max of, the one that maximizes mean survival, and then we go within plus or minus 10% of that to get the interval, because that's the variability of the measurements. There's a whole discussion of that in the paper. But here's a, a really neat graphic. Yen Shen Shu cooked this up along with the other stuff. As a function of age, the optimal AUC is in blue for the people that ha are in CR at transplant and in pink for the people that are not. And you see the intervals are really the same up until they're about 30, but as the patients get older, the optimal interval goes down for the patient with active disease. And so you see quite a, this is a, 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 a graphic that shows why it's very important to do personalized medicine um, when you, uh, 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 well, in this particular setting, and probably in many others. So um, there's a general package, DDP, GP, serve that allows you to do Bayesian non-parametric survival analysis for any data set, and it's extremely robust. So uh, I, I highly recommend it. Um, I realize I've gone kind of quickly, but you know we've only got 20 minutes, and I didn't want to go into too much mathematical detail. So at this point, I will uh, hand it back to Jack and the discussant. <laughs> Jack, can you hear me? Great. Hey, thank you, Peter. That was fantastic. Um, okay. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Nebi for the first discussion point. Uh, so, Nebi, over to you. Yes. Hi, uh, Peter. Um, thank you for inviting me to. Um, th thanks for the organization for inviting me as a discussant to this, to this talk. I do have one question around 
the the utilities described in the for the first clinical trial. Um, Peter, as you may recall, when we wrote our paper in 2003 um, for JAZA, one of the questions we got from the reviewers was around um, uh, the uh, sensitivity of the weights for total to toxicity burden. And the utilities here were elicited in that trial from a clinician. So I was wondering, did you do any simulations that looked at sensitivity to the utilities and choice of utilities? Yeah, we, we always do that. And I, I find that when the, the utilities, uh, uh, well, it, it, there, there was you know, one main clinician. You're talking about the ProGel trial? Yeah, the ProGel trial, yeah. exactly. So those came from Reza Mehron. And I, I said, you know, talk to your colleagues and see if they agree. Um, so if someone had very different, what we're doing is taking a continuous variable and turn it into, turning it into a utility as a convenience. But if you use the time to resolve itself, you'd have the wrong thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, we, we could do a sensitivity analysis, but we would not do the trial with other utilities. And so like, you know, the prior that you write down for a Bayesian model, when you use, do utility based clinical trial design, once you pick a utility, that's it. And, and so all I can say about that is if somebody at the end of the trial doesn't like the utility that was used to conduct it, we can give them the software and they can plug in their own utilities and see what the posterior inference would have been in a sensitivity analysis. So while you get one utility and one utility only interpret the results in different ways, they can write down three or four utilities and get three or four posterior inferences. Thank you. So one of the questions I had was just around, I mean, I love the, the talk, by the way, but one of the questions that I did have was when I'm looking at the methodology and you did a great job of walking through, um, especially prior to the ProGel talk, all of the different um, uh, tools that you leverage, Dirichlet process priors, Dirichlet process mixture priors, dependent Dirichlet process priors, Gaussian uh, process priors, um, is a lot of, of knowledge that goes into that. And my question to you is, how do we um, leverage all that's in the literature to help us move away from from um, you know what you talked about at the very beginning, which is value and a focus on uh, standard statistical techniques to these more innovative methodologies. Yeah, that that's a great question. It's you know how do we actually use this stuff? And and so what I suggest is there there are several review articles by Peter Mueller and colleagues, but Peter has also written two books, uh, and and. What you need to do is go through a process of learning about uh, 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 Bayesian nonparametric models. And at first, it may seem a bit strange, but after you, you kind of get the swing of things, you realize that there aren't that many basic ideas beyond what I presented here. And of course, you have to learn some details. A lot of the literature is extremely mathematical, and you can just avoid it. Um, people score brownie points by publishing very mathematical papers about Bayesian nonparametric. What practitioners ought to do is, first of all, get a hold of software so that you can actually do, do it yourself. Um, for example, that, that survival analysis program that Yan Shim Shu has provided um, for the DDPGP uh, model. But um, uh, also, uh, uh, look at applications. So if you study a particular application, and some of the applications are really wild. Um, you'll have the objects or sets of differential equations that describe weather patterns and so on. That is, you can describe uh, distributions on any kinds of objects you like, not just real numbers. So once you see applications and work your way through a few of them, you'll say, oh. And so if you're in the business of designing clinical trials, the way that I do it is to replace outcomes with utilities and use either robust Bayesian models or Bayesian nonparametric models. I think probably the, the greatest strength of Bayesian nonparametric will be in, in doing data analysis. And one caveat there is while these models give you full support, that is, they fit almost any data set and they provide shrinkage, you need a pretty good sized data set to get a reasonably good fit. 
So if you've got a data of set of 50, size 50, then you, you, you're hard pressed. Although we got a pretty good performance in that 48 patient progel trial. So sometimes it works if you, if you calibrate it well. Um, but I think that once you wade into it and, and look at some applications to get the basics of the models, you'll find there's not all that much there. Um, at some point, a lot of people are going to be transitioning over to Bayesian hierarchical models, Bayesian non-parametric models, and empirical Bayes. Um, and there's going to be more and more of that and less and less frequentist. And we'll be using Bayesian posterior probabilities instead of p-values to, to quantify our strength of evidence. So that, that's where things are going. Um, and I, I guess that's all I can say about it is you, there's going to be kind of a startup time to learn it, but the ideas are, well, they're pretty primitive. They're, they're pretty primitive and not all that hard to understand. All right. So I want to give um, Axel or anyone else an opportunity to ask some questions too. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for this interesting talk, Peter, and for the set of examples. I've got a couple of questions that just uh, the first one is probably a pretty specific one in the first example you have this treatment for air leaks after lung surgery and I was wondering whether your massive reduction in the sample size was mostly down to the change to intubation on parametrics or it was more down to using the utility function well it, I can't parse it out I can't say it was th this how much was from the utility how much was from Bayesian non-parametric there I'd have to do two different utility functions with the same model and then take one utility function and use two different models. So we didn't do that. It's a great question and I can't answer it. Okay. I suppose uh, I could get Yanshan if we wanted to, to go back and, and revisit the problem, doing it sort of the dumb way without the Bayesian non-parametric model. But um, I, I don't know how much was the model and how much was the utility. And the second question is oh, probably, in a way, you're using Bayesian non-parametrics, but of course there are also these more frequentist non-parametric models. Can you just elaborate? What's your view on that? What's the advantage well, of Bayesian non-parametrics compared to the frequentist? Yeah, the Bay name Bayesian non-parametric is a misnomer. Actually, they're infinitely parametric. It, the object that you're placing the dist prior distribution on is a probability distribution, and it's infinite dimensional. So, so it's a misnomer. And so to compare it to conventional frequentist non-parametric is rather misleading. But one thing I will say is that what you see in Bayesian non-parametric models are lots of parameters. If you notice, there are lots of covariate parameters and so on. And in non-parametric models, if you look at, for example, the log rank test, which is what everybody does for survival analysis, you're throwing out tons of information because you're using ranks. So there's always a, you know, you say, well, it's very robust. It's, yeah, that's fine, but you're losing a lot of information. With a Bayesian non-parametric model, you get full support and you get a great fit. So I, I'd rather do it that way um, than throw out all the information you lose by going to ranks. Right, uh, I've got one more question. Essentially, in setting up these Bayesian non-parametrics models, how much art is involved in this, basically? How much is this objective choices, and how much is this, basically, you, you need to know what works, so to speak? Well, you, you, yeah, you do need to know what works, and, and their imitation is great. You see what other people have done. And, and uh, I always say the way that I solve hard problems is I find people who are smarter than I am, and I, I say, you know, let's paint this fence. And so I get smart people like Yan Shen Shu and Peter Mueller and, and Mikhail Guindani to work with. Um, and uh, together we come up with, with clever solutions, but most of the clever ideas come from them. I'm, what I'm good at is problem definition. And I, I, I think that in that sense, I, I don't know how much of it is art, but I think an awful lot of it is. If you look at any really good applied statistics, there's a lot of clever thinking that went in there that began with problem definition and, and then saying, well, what can I do with my toolkit to address the problem? Uh, but in that regard, if all you do is imitate the sort of things that other people have done, you'll do pretty well. 
I think that's probably as much as we, uh, I should have time for. Uh, are there any four questions? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, one, we, yeah. Maybe you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to, I, I recalled, I just had one more question about the utilities with regard to the ProGel. Um, Peter, was that, were those average utilities with respect to the data or with respect to the predictive distri posterior distribution? No, they, they didn't have anything to do with the posterior. I, I just sat okay. down with Riza Mehron and I said, I want to know, you know, how, how good is it to resolve an intraoperative air leak or to never have it, to resolve it within five days, 10 days. In fact, he picked the five day intervals. And then he, he was the one that said, well, if it takes more than 40 days, it's, there's no point in bothering, you get a utility of zero. So, so okay. he was the one that picked the, the, the time interval and, and the sub intervals and so on. Uh, okay. I just kind of guided him. I always use a utility domain going from zero to 100 because it's convenient and it's easy for doctors to, to, to deal with. But one thing I have learned over the years is physicians love to give you their utilities. If you write down a very complicated outcome space and then partition it properly, physicians just, they say, gee, I, nobody's ever asked me this, this, this is wonderful. They like giving you the utilities of outcomes. And if it came down to it, you can also have, there's a whole process you go through where you get individual physicians to give utilities, then you show them the, the average, and then they get to give the utilities again, having seen the average. It's called the Oracle process. There are lots of ways to do it to get consensus, if you like. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you very one, much. One, one question came from the audience, what I'm seeing. So it's about how do these models cope with sensor data and how sensitive the methods are for sensor data? Uh, well, the survival model, of course, accommodates, you know, uh, not in, you know, in usual administrative right censoring. Um, they, the, the likelihood itself accommodates censoring, you know, of any sort that you like. So uh, if you look at the array of, of frequentist models that deal with all the different sorts of informative or non-informative censoring, same thing in the Bayesian world. You've just got priors on things. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, just a reminder there, if if you are listening and you want to ask a question, uh, the chat box chat box on the right hand side. If you just type your question in there, uh, we'll be able to see that and uh, get that to the uh, the presenters. Okay. I think for interest of time, we'll move on to the second presenter, uh, which is Kai Hali. Um, so if uh, Peter, if you could pass on control to. Uh, can you have, then we can. Uh, what, what do I do? Can, what where do I click? There I, should be a sharing. Sharing. In okay. the sharing tab and then um, change presenter, there should be a button there. Change presenter. Ah, there it is. And okay, there we go. Boom. Okay, so everybody can see my screen? Yes. All right. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and for giving me this uh, opportunity to present our work in this webinar. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about patient semi-parametric analysis of semi risk uh, data. And this is a co-work, I mean, joint work with my colleagues at Harvard, Dr. Sebastian Heinus, Deborah Schreck, and Francesca Dominich. Uh, since uh, our research was motivated by um, the analysis of Medicare data uh, from the patients who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So first I wanna give you a little background about the disease of pancreatic cancer. So approximately 56,000 people will be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in the United States in 2019. So unfortunately, there are no effective screening modalities. So about half of patients are diagnosed at very late stage, like distant stage. And large majority of patients are not eligible for surgical treatment. So chemotherapy is usually administered in the context of palliative care. And prognosis is very, very poor. So for combined stages, uh, the average five-year survival rate is only 9%. So it is very, very advanced uh, health condition. 
And the broad goal of our ongoing collaboration is to categorize and understand variation in quality of end of life care for patients diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And this quality of uh, care can be measured in many different ways, but our immediate focus is on readmission, uh, more specifically the readmission after discharge from hospitalization where the diagnosis of cancer was first given. The reason is that these hospital-specific readmission rates are calculated and reported by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the United States. And they use these readmission rates to determine a hospital reimbursement rate for subsequent year. So basically they use a simple logistic regression model. And then this quantity uh, and method is used for health conditions uh, with effective treatment options and raw mortalities like uh, pneumonia. Uh, but in our application, the things are a little bit different. So let's see some uh, descriptive statistics for our application. So let's consider outcomes, death, and our uh, outcome of interest readmission among 16,051 Medicare patients between 2005 and 2008. So based on those two outcomes and censoring at first 90 days after discharge, you can consider four possible outcome scenarios. We admitted and subsequently died, we admitted and censored prior to death, death we had readmission and censored prior to readmission or death. And now you can see more than 60% of patients actually died. So there is strong force of mortality for these patients. And also you can see that more than 46% of people died without readmission event, which is our primary interest. So here's our primary interest and the problem. So our primary interest lies with readmission and time to readmission, and then we want to calculate readmission rates, but we only observe readmission among the patient who have not died. And then data that exhibit this structure is often referred to as semi risk data because it's, uh, because it's a little bit different from the traditional company risk problem. So there are two events competing each other, uh, like readmission and death, but only death event, which we call terminal event, terminate, can terminate the readmission event, which we call non-terminal event, but not vice versa. So that way, it's a little bit different from traditional competing risk, and it's why uh, it is called semi-competing risk problem. But as a statistician, when you want to estimate the readmission rate for these types of application, you will think of uh, a, a much simpler approach, like what we call naive approaches. Maybe one of them could be logistic regression analysis, considering binary outcome, whether patients were readmitted or not at fixed time, maybe 30 days after discharge. But this approach ignores the death as computing risk because this is, again, univariate analysis. Or you can consider other univariate survival analysis like Cox regression, uh, and the new outcome is time to readmission. But again, this is univariate approach and you treat the death as an independent censoring mechanism. So you ignore the dependence between death and readmission events. And people also consider the composite endpoint analysis. And in this case, you, your outcome will be the first of either readmission or death. But this is kind of mixed outcome. So it can change your, I mean, it will change your scientific question. Even though you are solely interested in readmission, it's kind of mixed outcome. And furthermore, in the profiling context, if you handle death inappropriately, it could be uh, very problematic. Uh, for example, a hospital can have very low readmission rate if they do a poor job of keeping patients alive because they don't have a chance to come back to hospital after discharge. On the other hand, patient, I mean, hospital can have very high readmission rate, which is bad because they do a good job of keeping patients alive. So because they, have, they are alive and they are discharged and so they can come back to the hospital after discharge. So, uh, it's kind of um, unfair to the hospital. So maybe there is a way to uh, jointly uh, accommodate those uh, dependence between those two outcomes is to go with the semi computing risk analysis, but there is also issue with the semi computing risk approach. Uh, like I said, if a patient dies prior to readmission, time to readmission will not be observed. So we have some identifiability issue. That's because if you see this graph, um, this is time, T1 is time to non-terminal event, real admission, and T2 is time to death, terminal uh, event. 
you only observe the data from this upper wedge of past quadrant. So, so during the distribution of T1 and T2 cannot be identifiable on the lower wedge of this part quadrant using observed data. So you need some modeling assumption, but it, it is not uh, testable using your data. So that's the identifiable issue in this semi-coping risk problem. So let's see our modeling strategy. So maybe one intuitive approach to analyzing this semi-coping risk data is to view the data as arising from underlying illness death multi-state models. So basically you conceptualize this discharge and readmission and death events as a state. And uh, this system is characterized by three transition, one, two, three, uh, or intensity or hazard rate. And to permit the identifiability of the marginal density or joint density of T1 and T2 that we talked about, we set this uh, time to readmission T1 uh, to infinity if a subject experienced death prior to readmission. So after you form uh, the joint distribution of T1 and T2 on the upper wedge of the possible quadrant, any remaining probability mass will be assigned to along the line this uh, T1 equals to infinity. So you will have some additional density here. So that's how you form uh, the joint distribution of T1 and T2. And our further modeling strategy is to place a structure, actually Cox type model structure on three head of the function as follows. So you, now you have H1, H2, H3 corresponds to those three transitions. And now you have a uh, shared patient specific uh, frailty, random effect. And then you have continuous processes like baseline to the function H0, 1, 2, 3. And now you have linear predictor uh, with a, a vector of covariate and regression parameters. And if you want to go with the frequentist a non bayesian paradigm, the maximization over this uh, large parameter space could be a bit tricky, I mean, according to our experience. So we take the Bayesian approach. So as most of people know, the, there are potential benefits of the Bayesian paradigms. I mean, they include the ability to incorporate the substantive prior information and automated quantification of uncertainty for the measure of interest. And then prediction is uh, relatively straightforward. And then you can enjoy the uh, relatively prescriptive nature of computation. But in the development of Bayesian models, there are also three main challenges in our case. So you have to be able to specify the three continuous uh, processes based on the functions. And then you have to have a uh, prior specification and then you need to develop robust and efficient computational schemes. So I'm gonna talk about one of them here, uh, how to specify models for these continuous uh, processes, the baseline of the functions. So these are the highlighted in red, uh, H0, 1, 2, 3. So as we all know, the one simple way to move forward would be take the base as a function from some parametric distribution like exponential or variable distribution. And then this parametric modeling uh, could be beneficial in many cases, uh, especially uh, in data poor setting. And then we all know that the estimation and inference and prediction, they are much more straightforward with this parametric modeling. But uh, eventually we all we want to have more flexible model specification, but so, we also consider modeling each logarithm of this baseline, load, baseline has the function as a mixture of piecewise constant functions as follows. So this is lambda of t. And here, the s is uh, nothing but the partition of the observed time scale. And then this capital J is a number of, number of uh, time splits for this time axis. So this is fixed basically, but uh, within a Bayesian framework, we can treat this number of time split J and their position S uh, as a random uh, by assigning priors and update their values in MCMC sampling. So the result is that the value of this lambda of T in any given small interval uh, is marginally a mixture of piecewise constant function, so which means you will obtain very smooth curve as an estimation of this uh, baseline of the functions. All right, so this is the, so based on our modeling uh, formulation, you can obtain following observed data likelihood for model parameters. I'm not gonna go into detail. And then this is the prior distribution of, for the model parameters. So basically we used uh, the flat prior for regression parameter and multivariate normal distribution for baseline hedge of the function uh, component and Poisson distribution for number of time splits and even number of the statistic uh, prior for their positions. 
And this is nothing but the hyper prior for second stage polymerase. And we assign the gamma prior for uh, the subject specific random effect of frailty gamma. And we use the other gamma hyper prior for this frailty variance parameter. Uh, that induce the dependence between uh, two event times. So at the end, we eventually um, uh, developed an efficient computational scheme uh, based on random scan gives uh, sampling method. And most of the updates are quite straightforward by exploiting conjugacies and metropolis Hastings update. But certain moves uh, such as updating a number of uh, time intervals, uh, capital J, and their positions S, so updating those parameters requires a change in dimensional parameter space because depending on number of intervals, you'll have different number of hazard function parameters. So that's why we use the reversible jump MCMC uh, to update those uh, two parameters, two set of parameters. And then we developed the R package semi-country risk and they implemented our analysis using the package. And then for the computational efficiency, we uh, wrote every uh, core algorithm uh, in C and it is used as a primary computing engine. And in the package, you will see that we provide a lot of uh, very long uh, and a very helpful vignette documentation uh, that is specific to various uh, model choices that might be of interest to different research. So I hope you can uh, go uh, CRAN and then check the, our package. So finally, I'm going to give you some uh, the results from our uh, application motivating example. So again, the data available for this study consists of information on 100% Medicare patients from 2005 to 2008, and a total of 16,051 individuals aged 75 years old or older were considered. And for uh, readmission and death, we administered censored observation time at 90 days. And through this analysis, we will be able to identify the risk factors for time to readmission and also time to death. And we want to estimate the dependence between uh, these two event times, and we want to predict the probability of being readmitted and probability of uh, death. The pre uh, posterior medians and 95% credible interval for hazard ratio parameters are uh, e to the beta. So this is e to the beta one for readmission, a beta two for a death prior to readmission, and this is a beta three, death after readmission. So it corresponds to uh, those three transitions. And these are the set of covariage that we consider for the analysis, comorbidity index and race, gender, age, and care after discharge in a hospital stay. So from the results, you can see that there is evidence of increased risk. They are all larger than one, right? So increased risk for readmission associated with high comorbidity index, non-white race, uh, and male gender discharge to home care, and long initial hospital stay. And interestingly, our analysis also shows the evidence of decreased risk for death uh, for patients with non-white race who have not been readmitted prior to readmission, but the evidence of increased risk of death for an individual with non-white race after readmission. So they have opposite uh, direction, depending on whether patient is uh, readmitted or not uh, for this uh, covariate. So that's about the risk factor for redemission and death. And to, uh, for the illustrative purpose, uh, for, to go over the results for the prediction and also dependence measure between two event times, uh, we consider four different individuals uh, with different covariate profiles. So these are uh, four uh, subjects that we consider. They are called baseline subject, subject one, subject two, subject three. And then these are uh, the covariate values. So here's the results for the measure of dependence between these two event times. So we calculated a uh, so-called exploratory hazard ratio, EHR, which is nothing but the ratio of this H3 to H1, I, I sorry, H2. So intuitively you can interpret this as uh, like, it, a, this a, EHR describes how the risk of death, H2, change over time, given that uh, readmission occurred at time T1. So these figures um, show you the point posterior median and 95% credible interval for EHR estimate for these four individuals that we consider. For example, for this baseline subject, now you can see that a value of EHR is around three, four days after discharge, which means the occurrence of the readmission substantially increase the risk of death three times. 
for this subject at the day four following discharge. That's how you interpret this uh, EHR curve. And this figure shows you the post-therapeutic distribution for those four individuals. Now you see that the panel A to A through D show the post-therapeutic distribution, capital F of T1 and T2 for the upper range of possible quadrant. And this panel E through H provides the post-therapeutic distribution for capital F of uh, infinity of T2 for the case when that's occurred prior to that, uh, prior to readmission, sorry. Now you can see among these four individuals, subject one here has the highest post-therapeutic probability of dying following readmission through 90 days after discharge. It has highest probability. But on the other hand, this subject three uh, shows the fastest increase in the, pro in the predictive probability for death without readmission in the first 30 days after discharge. And then you can have uh, lots of uh, other interpretation from these figures, as you can see in the paper. So that's about our application results. And then I want to make several final comments. So the semi-computing risk framework provides an opportunity to think about any given line of research in a different way because it considered those two events, non-terminal events and terminal events jointly. And in my opinion, this semi-computing risk analysis is relatively underutilized in many uh, contexts. So to make this uh, analysis framework popular, uh, as I told you, we developed a semi-computing risk package with um, very comprehensive manual and vignette documents. So I hope you can uh, try those packages for your research. And then building upon this uh, RSS paper, uh, actually several very important extension has been made in uh, the past years. Uh, for example, like for cluster correlated semi-computing risk data, and then we published a method in JESA. And also we uh, developed a method in the context of AFD model. Uh, and also that method can handle very complex sensoring such as interval sensoring and lab truncation. And you can find that uh, paper in biometrics. And this is an acknowledgement page for my co-authors and colleagues and um, the support from NIH funds. Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you, Kaiha. That was a, a great presentation. Um, okay, so we'll move on now to a discussion. Just as a reminder, if you do want to answer, or ask a question, uh, you can use the chat box, that box on the right-hand side. Uh, and to start the discussion, I'm going to hand over to Axel. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Kiyoha. That was a very interesting paper and interesting presentation. Maybe for the benefits of us all, can you just elaborate once more on the difference between traditional competing risks and the semi-competing risks problem. Uh, that, that, uh, that's a very good point because the semi-competing risk we have a uh, best of uh, amount of literature and then why we don't use this competing risk uh, approach to this uh, application. So uh, I think that uh, we have the restriction in the traditional competing risk analysis for our application. Uh, that is uh, we cannot learn about uh, the joint distribution of those two events. So in other words, uh, more operationally, the restriction is that the competing risk analysis would be based only on H1 and H2 in our modeling uh, framework, for example. So H3, uh, the model for uh, death after readmission is not considered as a part of the model specification. So the information observed in the timing of death events after readmission event is not used or uh, even acknowledged in the traditional company risk problem. So um, the fact that we cannot learn about this dependence is uh, again inherent to company risk setup uh, unless we are willing to make untestable assumption. So it is very well known that uh, dependence between event to these two events is not identifiable in the company risk setup. So but this is not the case in the semi-computing risk problem because we have partial information on the joint distribution that is available through some patient who have who experienced those both events. So I believe not using this information would be uh, losing a crucial opportunity for our analysis. So I think that would be one of the main uh, difference between uh, semi-computing risk and uh, traditional uh, computing risk problem. Thank you. There's one point I'd like to pick up on. And you said you are doing joint modeling. I think that's probably a good way of understanding what's going on here. So basically what you're doing is 
the hazard rate of the terminal event gets basically changed whenever a non-terminal event occurs. That's right. And your your approach basically switch from one hazard rate to a completely well not completely different hazard rate. You have you have the same underlying risk factor gamma in there. And of course you could do imagine other changes to that hazard rate. At the most basic, you would simply have a time dependent covariate in the Cox model for the uh, terminal event that mm -hmm. switches from zero to one whenever the non terminal event occurs. Um, I was just wondering whether you've explored this kind of flexibility with how much of a change you do to the um, hazard rate for the terminal event when the non terminal event happens. Yeah, I mean, actually, we haven't explored that uh, possibilities, but obviously, that's the 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 reasonable direction of research that should go. So uh, that's actually one of our uh, the the item. I mean, the ideas in our research uh, list, actually. So yeah, I agree with you. That's very important, but we haven't explored it yet. Yeah. Okay. Um. The. Other questions is more or less for the user of these methods. We've got this wonderful R package. Mm -hmm. It's just the question, of course, that it implements an MCMC method. So then the question is how stable is the code? How much can people rely on the output? I think somewhere in your paper you wrote something you took. It's about two million steps of your MCMC sampler. Mm -hmm. Something like that. So um, I was just wondering whether you could slightly comment on potential pitfalls if people use this MCMC sampler in your package I see because um, so I talk about um, what would be the disadvantage using the uh, our package you uh, so it may require the long MCMC run or well, maybe what, what should people watch out for basically they use your package they start your MCMC sampler they get a result what should they be worried about uh, I see so I mean yeah, I, I can only think about good things about my pages. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so yeah, the, maybe the most one of the most challenging part is that because um, you have to tune the proposal density in the most of the Bayesian computation. So maybe you have to run several uh, iteration to see whether your Emerson chain is going to the right direction. So that would be the the pitfall, and then the some consideration that that users should. Uh, take care of, but uh, but the, or the good thing is that well, we provide a, a function to initialize the starting value of the model parameters and also how to specify regional prior and hyperparameter values. So uh, it is very convenient. And then as your output, yeah, okay. So yeah, that's the things that yeah, so people should consider. Yeah, it could be the potential people. Yeah. I think in the interest of time, I should give Nebi a chance to give his questions and comments. Sure. I don't know if I have enough time. I, I had actually just one question and it is maybe a little bit um, going back to the model that was chosen. Um, so so you decided to use a, a mixture of piecewise constant hazards and and I, I just want to make sure I heard correctly. Um, the the partition points for that mixture were were random as well as the total number of of components. My my question was uh, with respect to those partition points. Does the model ensure that there's data in every single component, and does that does that matter? Oh, like, are there events, and not data, but of actual events, in the component, and does that's that? Right. Make that's a very good point. So, uh, we need the data to update those parameters in, in any given interval. So if data is not contained uh, and observed in the given uh, partition or interval, then that corresponding time partition will be removed from uh, the time partition based on kind of uh, log, I mean, uh, likelihood ratio test, I mean, in frequency. So you at each update, you will uh, check the acceptance probability based on your uh, given partition in current state and also proposed partition. So, so depending on the, how much data support your current partition, uh, it will be adapted and then automatically updated uh, in the Bayesian MCMC sampling. So yes, to update the parameter, yes, you need the data. But if, you, if uh, any specific interval doesn't contain the data, 
that partition will be adaptively, uh, I mean, it will be adjusted based on data. So essentially, so essentially the, 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 the elements in S mm -hmm. will be collapsed if there's no data in a given. Exactly. That's okay. how it works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. That's a good point. Yep. I suppose I could just continue with some questions that came in from the audience. Uh, one question is uh, the techni a technical question. Since you're using improper priors in your model on mm -hmm. some of the parameters, is the propriety of the posterior, well, it's, it's obviously not immediately guaranteed in general. Do you have, have you looked at all at the conditions for that to be the case, so that, you have, that you have a proper posterior? So to be honest, uh, we didn't theoretically we didn't check the the property. I mean, of the poster distribution from those priors, we only checked the property in the numerical studies. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and there's another question. This is of course a more general question. Once you start moving to Bayesian models, uh, how is model checking performed in the setup with respect to Cox models? Of course, in frequentist models, people are quite used to looking at some sort of residuals. Should sure, uh, put residuals or something like that. How do you do this in this Bayesian setup? In the Bayesian setup, especially for um, survival analysis uh, in Bayesian paradigm, I believe the, the Peter also has uh, sort of uh, good comments about this. But uh, what people usually do is that they calculate the DIC and LPML, which is a uh, log pseudo uh, marginal likelihood value. So it's kind of uh, kind of Bayesian counterpart of the leave one out validation so that's how do they do the model validation that and that's what we uh, use as a metric of the model validation yes there's just one more question coming in are any books recommended for reference i'm not sure whether this is for this talk or for both talks but maybe you could both uh, i think both presenters if they find the time to say a few words of what, what books could people look at to get started on these topics for my case, I mean, my kind of a Bible, a textbook for the Bayesian survival analysis is the, the book by uh, Ming-Yi Chen and Joey Brahim. So I think that is very good book. And then that's where I started uh, my research on this topic. So I highly recommend that uh, the reference, Bayesian survival analysis. And Peter, I'm not sure whether you are. Uh, can you hear me? You yeah. Yes. Very well. Yeah, I, I would just recommend the two books that Peter Mueller has published very recently. One of them is a, a formal book. Another one, I think, is a collection of chapters. Um, there's some there's some very mathematical books on base. Would not recommend for for people to start out with, but mm -hmm. but it would be nice to just get some survey papers. He's I I don't have them in front of me, but he he wrote some very nice introductory papers that have lots of nice examples. You can start there and then you can invest in, in, in the books. But I, I don't have the titles in front of me. Just look, look up Peter Mueller on the internet and find his books. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, unless there are any further questions or comments, uh, I think that will be all. Uh, so that, I think that now concludes the uh, the PSI and RSS Journal Club. So thank you to both speakers, Peter and Kayuha. Uh, they were fantastic presentations. Uh, and also thank you to the discussants for their invaluable input. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your time today. Uh, for uh, a recording of this webinar, you can look on the PSI video on demand service at psiweb.org. Uh, and we'll be sharing this shortly. So with that, thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.